The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You're back in the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AMCL. I'm Al Warren. And I'm Kev Thompson. Today we are doing uh, The Bayou Strangler, Louisiana's most gruesome serial killer. And, of course, the author is a uh, returning guest, friend of the show, Fred Rosen. Hello, Al. Hello, Jeff. How are you all doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Do, doing good. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. That's what I'd like to hear. So, uh, what is Fred doing in Louisiana? <laughs> uh, I made a wrong turn at the Mississippi River. Um I'll tell you what happened. Uh, that this this story goes back. It has a really good history, and it goes back to uh, uh, about you know, it would have been 2008. And I read a story in in the paper about um, this serial killer, Ronald J. Dominic, who had killed and confessed to killing um, 23 men, and. I had not heard anything about it. And I said, what is this? I'm, I'm supposed to be a true crime author. I investigate murder cases. Why haven't I heard about this? So it took me a couple of months to, to look into it. And then I, I, I realized, and I, I write about this in the book, that uh, the, the fact is the media does not cover crimes that occur in the South as well as the covered crimes that occur in other places, especially the East and, and the West. <clears throat> and the fact that the most of the victims were gay and the serial killer was gay, they didn't want to touch it. And I was like, I was shocked. You know, I mean, the way I was raised was one human life is the same as another. It never occurred to me that the media... I mean, I'm the most naive guy in the world. I never occurred to me the media would discriminate with a serial killer and victims. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So, I, 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 at that time, I was able to get an assignment from somebody to do a book about it. And I made that left turn, and, and I went down to... Uh, to New Orleans, I flew down to New Orleans, and then I rented the car, you know how it goes, and, you know, and I went further south to Homer, Louisiana, to investigate. They let you drive down there? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I say uh, that. I no, I say that because um, this is funny, but not. The, um, okay, well, there's a congressman down there that... Uh, was interviewing on the radio show, not ours, but another one that's in uh, Toronto, and he was suggesting that Canadians should get uh, have to pass a driver's license to drive in the states because they're not used to driving on pavement. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> well, I, and I just realized you're talking about the Andrew Pansy show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I just... <laughs> really. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I'll tell you something. You know, I try, it, it is very interesting when you drive in Louisiana south, you get into the bayou area, and you got all these bayous, which are, of course, incredible places to um, uh, to get rid of bodies. And, and and so I decide, so I get into the town. I already made a re, uh, an appointment to speak to the be one of the chief investigators in the case, Tom Bergeron, who's an incredible detective. And I get into the town, and I remember that in every Western I've ever seen, I love Westerns, and every Western I've ever seen, the first thing you do when you go to the town is you go into the local bar and you talk to the barkeep, and you ask them questions. So only Fred Rosen would go into the local bar and walk in, and the first thing I said to the bartender was, uh, so what do you think of Barack Obama? Oh, my <laughs> God. Lord. Oh, my God. I, I, you could have heard a pin drop. And 
then I said, well, what do you think about uh, uh, the serial killer, Ronald J. Tommy? And he killed most of the people in, in, in Terrebonne Parish, which is Homa, Louisiana. And I said, well, what do you think of this guy? Every, these people go, never heard of him. I said, you never heard of a serial killer that was delivering pizza to your house? Because he was a pizza delivery man, among other jobs. I said, oh, no, we never heard of the guy. And I, I'm going, oh, my God, I'm up against something here, buddy. Man, oh, man, I've never had this happen. <laughs> well, you know, but when well, you say that with discrimination, because, you know, one thing, when uh, we talked to the, one of the mind hunters earlier, the FBI, and, um, you know, one thing that they said in the book that really stuck with me, they were talking about Jack the Ripper, and the first two, mm-hmm. first two girls that were murdered, and because it was Whitechapel and they were hookers, nobody even talked about it. In fact, all of the people that in regular society, like that were living in London, um, well, they, their opinion was, well, it's not news; they're just hookers. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, you know, and so I have. It, it's just yeah, that, I, yeah. It was just that thought that, well, it's just gay people. Yeah, and I, well, you know. see, that's it. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to talk over you, but it's just that he, I get very emotional about this because I did a book. The first story I ever did on serial killers was about a guy in Poughkeepsie, New York, near where I live, named Kendall Francois, who killed uh, eight women who were prostitutes and stashed them in his house, and they were prostitutes. And I, I said, I don't understand. I was living in the area. Why didn't I read about this? Because they were prostitutes. They don't pay taxes. There's no pressure from the citizenry to get these people. And I go, I don't get this. And and, and when it, when and in this case, in this case, because these guys, a lot of these guys were gay uh, 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 counselors that that were victims of of, of Dominique. This was even worse. It was even worse. I mean, I, they, they didn't want to cover anything. I had, a, I, had a, I had an editor at a major publishing house, Al Jeff, that I worked with on many books, okay, especially earlier in my career. So, guys, you can look it up. Um, she, uh, she said to me, well, the guy's gay, and, the, you know, and the serial killer's gay, and the victims are gay, so, you know, nobody's interested. I'm sitting there and I'm going, what about human life? And not to mention it's a great story, but human life, why are we devaluing somebody because of their sexuality? That's, excuse me, uh, you know what, uh, this is America, you know, and I realize, I realize, seriously, I realize that a lot of people don't get it. Including some uh, some guy that's running uh, still for um, gee, he, I think he's still running for Senate down in Alabama, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> see, did I get political? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, well, Fred, Fred, uh, let, let me interge- let me interject here and, and, and throw a whole new aspect on this. Do you think? I mean, you know, we're we're, we're talking the gay angle right now, but do you think that it could possibly be one of two things? actual ignorance about the crime or the fact that, you know, deep south, the the culture is a fairly closed culture. They're not very willing to talk to people because of these type of illusions. So do you think that maybe they just really weren't willing to talk to you about it? You know what? You just made a great point, and I think you're right. Um, in fact, Ironically, it turned out that one of my best friends from film school, 40 years ago, I just dated myself, and I don't care because I look younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 he came from this, he came from that house. He lived in Homa. Not when this happened, but he lived in Homa. And I agree with you. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, how you brought up. We're talking about the same thing. How you brought up. And yes, it is a very repressive culture, and Don Bergeron, who, who opened up for Hartman, she was the chief detective on the case, her and a guy named Dennis Thornton from New Orleans, because Dominic moved around at the beginning of, of the killing spree, and she told me, and it's in the book, that this is really interesting, that she had been on 
on this uh, like special victims unit, uh, you know, that we you know, what we would call a special victims unit involving sex crimes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that uh, and she claimed that in the Cajun culture, uh, incest was common. Now I don't know if it is or isn't, this is what she told me. And I'm sitting here, you know, like I don't believe this. But then again, you know, uh you know, I, I mentioned Roy Moore, I think, and, you know, that's a state where 16 is the legal age. And, you know, you, got, you know, we don't, you know, Americans don't understand that the legal age of consent, let alone marriage, changes from state to state. Mm-hmm. Good. And, yes. And, 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 the, and the most important thing to say here is, you know what, ignorance is not confined, obviously, to one section of the country. It's all over the place. Otherwise, Donald Trump wouldn't be president. So, you know, <laughs> it's what it is. Oh, I got political with him. You know, this is the only show where I get political. But you know, <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I realize I'm supposed to be here to talk about a book and, 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 and so forth. But you know something? I I also feel like, you know, I want to be an American and, 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 and talk what I feel is the truth. And of course, people are going to attack me, but that's okay. There's nothing new about that. No, not, you know? not here. We're an open forum. <laughs> yes, I know that. But besides, I'll, inter- I'll introduce him to my friend Steve Rogers. He's also from Brooklyn. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's all, an alternate identity of Captain America. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, seriously, it's, this, this, this book really was, was changed my life in a lot of ways. It really, Helped me to understand the the ingrained prejudice against gay, lesbian, transgender people in the United States of America. And I felt my job was to do what I always do, which is I need to demonize these people, and that's exactly what I did. There's, there's, you know, when I wrote about these individuals, I talked about the um, their families, their relationships. And by the way, some of these individuals were were not gay. What Dominique would do would be uh, he would lure straight guys to his trailer where he did where, where he where he did his thing to them. He would lure them with um, photographs of naked women, claiming that if you come to the trailer. There's going to be a naked woman you can mess around with. Oh, Lord. And that, yeah, but you know what's cool? That's what led the cops to get him. It was really interesting. It was a, it was a straight guy who was a parolee, and it was eventually a task force form to get Dominic because he was killing people from ni- uh, late 90s until 2006. And your your kill total at that point is up to about ooh nineteen or twenty, and um, they had a parole officer on the task force, and Don Bergeron and Dennis Thornton, the two chief detectives on it. Imagine a male female team. I still think it's like a hell of a movie. But the the thing is, they. Uh, they said to the parole officer, "Hey, do you have any parolees that might have had a, a, a run with a bad guy who, you know, did this and that?" And he asked these parolees, and one of them did it, and that's what led them to Donald. And that's what that's you know, it's this is one of those cases, guys, where the reason it's solved is primarily from shoe leather, mm-hmm. you know, and and the detectives, the detectives were, oh my God, they're, they're the complete opposite of the um, stereotypes of Southern sheriffs that you see in the movies. Uh, <laughs> these guys were, co- not forget colleges, they had master's degrees. <laughs> they got master's degrees and, and in criminal justice, and they were raised the right way by their parents. And they just determined they were going to get this guy because he, what, what Dominique would do is he would, he would kill these people, but he wouldn't dump the bodies in the bodies. He put them out in the open. He was taunting them. Come he and wanted, get me, he, Yeah, he wanted to be found. 
Uh-huh. So, Fred, I, I got to ask you, having said that, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but having no, said that, like <laughs> and, and you mentioned, you know, by this time there's already 20. So I got to ask you about a pattern because that's what I look for. You know, mm-hmm. let's, let's, let's say his first couple kills were practice. Then right. the typical serial killer kind of finds a method, they develop a signature, and they will follow that method. Then they tend to get either arrogant or sloppy, and that's what leads eventually to their capture. What was his pattern? What a great question, boy, oh boy. Um, that's why we have <laughs> 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 no, I mean it. I mean, when you, when you use that word signature, I go, oh, that's cool. Um, the pattern, okay, the pattern was that what Dominic would do is, first, when he was in New Orleans, he would actually just go to a, a place called the Rawhide, which was a very prominent gay bar, and um, he would go in there and he would just, sit down, have a beer. Mm-hmm. I, I, used, I used to dance there. <laughs> oh, you, are you serious? No. <laughs> oh, because, because I was just going to say, thank God. You know, I mean, it's like, he, he would go, well, no, he would, he would not he would not be the guy. Uh, no, he would go in there, and he would, uh, you know, chat up somebody, and, he, you know, at the bar, he'd have a beer, and, uh, you know, and he said, oh, and, you know, they, they do a, uh, you know, a little dickering, no pun intended, about how much for, you know, this kind of a special act and so forth. And then he'd leave, and he'd go to his car, and what he would do then is uh, they would have sex of one sort or another, and then he would use his weight, because he's a very big guy, and he would get on top of them, and then he would strangle them. He was very, um, you know, he looked like just a uh, just a very heavy person. You know, back in the day, people would use the term fat, but heavy is a better, certainly a better term. And he, then he would strangle them, and then what he would do is he'd ride around with the body in the car, and um, there was no signature as far as, Al, there was no signature as far as... Um, um, well, the, the real signature was he'd ride around, find a place where he could dump the body where nobody would see him, and it would always be in the open. And after the, the, the first couple of times he does it, Dennis Thornton, who's this uh, New Orleans detective, he's going, oh, well, it's the same guy. I mean, Dennis, Dennis is a smart guy, but what happened was Dominique felt them closing in a little on him, or actually it would have been uh, Thornton, because Thornton was just this, he was dogged in finding the guy, and so he then got in the car, and he had a trailer, and he, he towed it back down, which is about, I don't know, maybe it was 100 miles or something from New Orleans to Homa on the Gulf, and he wound up getting a trailer um, um for a while, he had a separate trailer in a very isolated area. Uh, and so his the real signature was the fact that he dumped the bodies in the open, every single one. And it, at one point, he even avoids a police dragnet. He was a very, very smart guy. Mm. So now, it, it says here in the preview, too, that they were all uh, African-American men. Um, with, I think there, I, I, there, there were a couple of white guys, but yes, but that's primarily, I would say that's due to, to the fact that, uh, uh, first it's, it's, it's a question of, um, where it happened and also the fact that, uh, in, in some of these areas in, in the deep south, African Americans are still, behind the eight ball when it comes to dollars and cents. They're, they're the lowest rung on the lowest rungs economically, so they're incredibly vulnerable that way. And so some of these individuals, in fact, a friend of mine was pointing out to me, Jim Seeley, who I, I nicknamed Mr. True Crime. He's a, uh, 
he, he's a, 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 a travel agent who put together the Kenda cruises with Lieutenant Joe Kenda. Is it, have you had Lieutenant Joe Kenda on the show yet, Al? No, no, I tried to get him once, but uh, he, his, his uh, agency never even responded. Well, I'll leave it to me. I'll get him. I'll get him. Okay. Because, he's, because Kenda's good friends with, with, with Jim. And the thing is, what Jim pointed out to me is that Freddie said, you know, a lot of the guys you're talking about in the book may have been bisexual. And not to mention the fact that when people don't have money, they'll do it. Let's face it. If you haven't had, if, 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 you, if, if you've never been in poverty, and I have been, you don't know what, you know what you're capable of doing until you're in that situation. And, you know, and how desperate you are, including, you know, doing sexual acts with a guy like, like Dominique because it's going to pay, you know, it's going to pay for food. Whatever it might be, and 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 that's the part that really bugs me, which is again the media doesn't want to talk about this stuff. You know, we're talking about a subclass of individuals in the United States who are still suffering. You know, when we we're in 2017, they were suffering back then. And I'm not a bleeding heart liberal. I'm a middle of the road, or I'll vote for anybody. You know, but uh, you know, but this is a fact. I, at least I think it's a fact. And so um, in terms of his choice of victims, he, uh, like most serial killers, Dominique had that second um, sight, so to speak, where he would choose the most vulnerable, the, those that needed the money the most. And then, then he, you know, that, and, and, and he, all, he, was, he was pretty, uh, the only time, actually, that, as we're talking, the only time he dumped the, uh, no, that's right, yeah, 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 he, he, no, he, he, dumped, he always dumped the bodies in the open, always dumped the bodies in the open. I think there was one time where he, he used a, uh, yeah, that's right, he used a, a storage facility and he dumped the body there, but that was it. You know, it was just convenient. I mean, he, he's just, you know, this guy, and, you know, if you, you, you look at the picture of the guy, you know, he looks like the most innocuous person you'd ever see. Um, what was fascinating about him was when, when the cops finally got to him, and, you know, we can, you know, they, he really talked a lot about his background. Oh, my God. He, he talked about how his family discriminated against him. You know, it, it's so interesting to me, you know, you know, no matter what, you know, any of us have gone through, when you start talking about somebody, you know, a family discriminating against you because of your sexuality, your mother giving you a hard time, and your, your cousins, your siblings, all those, that, that's got to be the most awful thing in the world. I mean, it, you know, I mean, look, I had a hard enough time when I decided to become a writer. You know, people think that, uh, you know, Jewish families, um, there I go again, getting into trouble. I think Jewish families, <laughs> stay with me on this one, Jeff. Uh, people think that, you know, that, you know, it, it's a big deal if you become a writer. No way, man. I was supposed to become a lawyer, you know? Mm, and yeah, I became a writer, a and everybody thought, I, you know, or, a doc, or a doctor, as we used to say in Brooklyn. But they, they you know, People, you know, sure, I understand that, you know, everybody wants you, you know, your family wants you to make a lot of money and all that stuff. But you've got to go with your heart, whether it's your, 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 what you're going to do for a living and or what your sexuality is. Uh, you know, and I, and I guarantee you that if, that if Tom Jefferson and, 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 and John Adams were around today, they'd say the same thing. Okay, so what was his point in killing these people, like all these guys? Like, uh, why was he okay. doing it? Who was he trying to pick? Impress? Yeah, like what was what was the point of it? I, I the, the point of it, well, it was a couple of things. Great question again. Um, mm -hmm. The point of it is, first, what would happen is 
it would be a, situ a situation where primarily he would pay these guys, and he would pay them, you know, for oral sex. But sometimes they wanted to have anal sex. Well, he had some problems with his, with his, uh, with his anus for various reasons that I talk about in the book. And he felt uh, that if, he, if they forced themselves on him, he would, um, he, he would um, uh, uh, hemorrhage, okay? And so anytime somebody touched him there, he would go ballistic because he's gone to prison for some minor thing. Like most serial killers, he had a, he had a very um, record, okay? But he's gone to prison, and he'd been raped in prison, he claimed. And that, that's why he had problems with, you know, his, his anus and so forth. And so if anybody touched him there, he went ballistic. And he also wanted the attention to show that he was something because his family thought he was a piece of you-know-what, you know, and, um, and he wanted that attention. There is no question about it. He wanted that attention. And um, to me, what, yes, yes, he wanted it. And, well, the, I actually got to go into the trailer where he actually killed most of these guys. Oh, my God. They, the cops uh, preserved it. And it was a weird one because, look, I, 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 got, I believe in vibes, okay? You get a vibe. You get a feeling. It was, it's not like it was blood or anything, but, man, it didn't feel good. And the guy had Christmas decorations up all the entire year. And I'll never forget this. There was this baseball. And I'm looking at the baseball. I'm going, oh, please don't tell me he's a baseball fan like me. <laughs> you know, what, please don't tell me this. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was, he was, he was so smart. I mean, he, he had this trailer parked on his brother-in-law's property in a really isolated area. So he, he, he kidnapped these guys. Not kidnapped. He, he, he'd uh, lure them back to the trailer where he would, um, uh, you know, they'd have sex, and then, then he, would, he would throttle them. A couple of times he also hit them with a, with a wrench or, or, or you know, whatever he had handy. And, and then he would just take the body... And instead of throwing it in the bayou, which of course would be the smartest thing if you're a bad guy, he put it back into the car and find some place and dump it. And one of them actually was very, he dumped this body. Matthew, what's his name? The kid in Colorado who was gay, who was killed. Shepherd. Um, Matthew. Shepard. Shepard, thank you. He, he took one of the bodies and he put the body over a fence, just like Matthew Shepard. And you know what's ironic about that? <laughs> um, that goes back into the mid-90s, and I, I'll st I still remember this. In, in one of the first episodes of, of uh, Superboy, they do that with, with young Clark Kent, you know, the bad guys, not knowing who they're dealing with, you know? Yeah. That was a very iconic image. And there's no question that Dominique was certainly one of the smartest, he is the smartest serial killer I have ever written about. you got to be pretty smart to get away with 23 murders. But the other thing I should mention is there was no attempt, because they didn't have the resources to use geographic profiling. If they used geographic profiling, they would have got him a long time earlier, but they didn't have the resources. And the most important thing in a serial killer case is the linkage. How do you link a crime in New Orleans and a crime in Homa or, or another parish? Well, you got to have some really smart detectives on the case. And luckily, that's what happened here. Did you stay the whole night in the trailer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, para, paranormal lockdown. <laughs> well, that no, a oh, oh, that's good. 
paranormal lockdown. Oh, that's good. Oh, I could never come up with a line like that. Um, no, I didn't. I, I was only in it for, you know, they, you know, Dawn let me go in for about 20 minutes. I mean, it's very unusual for a police officer who lets you go into the scene of the crime. You know, you don't get to do that in my business. Usually, you know, we, we, you know, we show up after the fact and so forth. But that allowed me to describe the, you know, what it was about, you know, the interior. I mean, which helps the reader, you know, put themselves in, in the shoes of, of one of the victims, you know, which is what you try to do, you know, and, you know, and, you know, in the storytelling. Um, but, and he had, by the way, he had two trailers. He had two, one of I always get confused, you know, trailer and motorhome, you know. I, I'm from Brooklyn. We didn't have trailers, you know. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have skiing, you know. Uh, I didn't open any of that stuff. So, um, um, you know, we didn't have pork, though. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that another time. But, um, um, but seriously, um, he had one motorhome and he had one trailer. And he used both as uh, the scene of the crime, essentially. He, he, a couple, only, only the first couple of, you know, I think, right, it's only the first couple of times he used the car to, to uh, kill his victims. The rest of the time, nah, he was, he was smart enough to take him someplace, you know, to the trailer or the motorhome and do his thing. This guy was so, was so brazen that he even killed somebody during a hurricane and went out in the middle of the hurricane to dump the body. I mean, oh man, I, I couldn't get over this, you know. And here I am, like tooling around in my car. I love that word, tooling. It, it's, it's 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 an old word, you know. I'm driving around and I'm looking at these bodies and I'm like, alligator guy. And by the way, they, they, they when Dawn took me to lunch one day, and she took me to this, you know, we would call it a diner. Uh, I, I guess you'd call it a diner wherever it is. And with all these cops, you know, they happen to be there. And so I sit at the table, must have been a dozen of these guys. You know what they do? They order French fried alligator to have me eat it. And I knew that they, they were, you know, testing me. So, of course, I, I ate it. And I looked them straight in the eye and I said, ah, oh, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> Everything tastes like chicken. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, again, what got me about it was the fact that don't, uh, uh, when they finally got the serial killer task force together, as this guy's been doing his thing across southern Louisiana for almost a decade, um, it was Don and Dennis who realized what the pattern was. And put it, and the linkage, 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 which is everything in a serial killer case, linkage. You gotta be able to, to, to link a crime over here and a crime over there. These people were, I, I don't have words, but they were to describe how wonderful they are. And I, you know, I'm not somebody who thinks that police officers are the greatest thing since uh, shop liver. Um, which I haven't refrigerated, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, these people put it together and they, you know what? They worked on their own time. They took time away from their families to get this guy. That's how much they valued human life. They didn't care if the, the, the victims were gay. And, you know, I look at this and I say, well, wait a second. If, if the cops on the case, value human life, why doesn't the mainstream media feel the same way? And I don't have any answers, okay? I, I don't. Um, I mean, you know, I talk about it a little in the book. You know, I do talk about it a little in the book. Um, um, and um, it, 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 it's funny, though, because <laughs> uh, I later... Uh, uh, one of the first, the first, I think, yeah, it was the first serial, the uh, second, second set of serial killers I wrote about were Big Harp and Little Harp, and Erica's first serial killers in the 1790s. Now, ladies, did a show an idea about them? And I had forgotten that when I was a kid, and maybe you two, Al, you know, most of us remember Baby Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, and I mentioned this in the book. Walt Disney did a sequel to that, and in that in that sequel, Davy and Julie.
Ricky Russell, who's sidekick played by Buddy Epson, they go up against Big Hart and Little Hawk, the serial killers. Isn't that something? You know, mm-hmm. that's really something. And, uh, uh, but, so, you know, the, the, the whole issue of serial killers in our culture has been there since the 1790s. Um, and, you know, I just thought of something else, actually. I uh, I, so now, whatever happened to this guy? So uh, he got caught. And what was the what was the final results? Was he sentenced to life? Oh, what happens is the once they get Dominique into the interview room and he, they make a deal, and the deal is confess to all twenty three murders. We'll charge you with only a couple. We'll take the death penalty off the table, but you've got to take us to the dump site, which is the place we dump the bodies, so they know for sure that he's telling the truth, and that's what they do. And then, when with the case, there's no trial, they just make a deal, life and, you know, a couple of, you know, prison, sen- uh, what do you call it, life, life sentences. And then, the victim's uh, families get to give victim impact statements. Incredible, I never, uh, these are so emotional. I mean, I've been in courtrooms where this has happened, but this, even reading this stuff was, was incredibly emotional. And I came away from this realizing that Americans have stereotypes in terms of where people come from. And I mentioned this earlier, and they think that all Southern sheriffs are like the cops in the movies, you know, like Ross Steiger in the, in the Heat of the Night or uh, um, Sheriff J.W. Pepper or whatever his name is in the James Bond films. <laughs> but that's not the case. These two detectives, Don Bergeron and Dennis Thornton, I know I keep mentioning them, but the fact is I've never seen, I've never seen a duo. These, they were a dynamic duo, Okay. And I will not apologize to Batman and Robin, okay, especially considering Batman is now played by Ben Affleck. Ooh, that's <laughs> awful. Ooh, excuse me. You know, <laughs> did I say ooh? <laughs> oh, so, um, but, but it, it, it's so, you know, it's just so interesting, you know, to, to write about these cases. And I, I actually have been fortunate enough to go across the United States and write about them. And by the way, um, and I'll throw this out to you guys and people can comment. Um, I would be very hard pressed to come up with a, uh, a big true crime book written about something in New York City where I come from. And I think the reason is is because the police officers there are not cooperative with the media. And they think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they're not. Sorry, guys. You have a problem with that? I'm someplace else. Come and get me. You know. <laughs> it, 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 but seriously, there, there is, you know, we have to avoid stereotypes. If there's anything that, can, that people get out of my interview today, avoid stereotypes. Makes no difference what somebody's sex is. Makes no difference what their sexuality is. Avoid the stereotypes. Treat them as individuals. If we did that as a nation, oh my God, we would be so far along. I can't believe I'm saying this stuff. Should I write for Congress? Well, you might as well. <laughs> might as well. But I, I hear you have to assault a minor first. Yeah, not since you broke them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to get. I was, in, yeah. I was just drinking something. I'm a well, but you know what? You know what? I don't look. I, I look. You're editing. I'll just say it. You know. You know when you're reading about this stuff. You know, it's like every single day you're seeing something different about somebody assaulting a minor, or even if it's somebody who isn't a minor, they're using their position to assault them. And 
it's clear. It's clear there is something in our culture that allows men to assault women and it's not been mediated the right way to stop it, let alone stopping pedophilia. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah, there's there's something in the culture because even it, it's not just Hollywood or it's not just politics. Yes. Cuz you yes. know, you know when we have people on and talk about facts and numbers and and uh even Chris Hansen said to me that um you know they they would do their setup stings and they would get 60 or 70 a day of mainly men um going to pick up a 13-year-old girl online on their little traps and you're gonna think this is all over in all the different cities all that there's something going on in the culture that does this well and, and again you know and and you know what and as we're talking about this i i believe we'll really get and, and i i think this is american culture i can't talk about canadian or something else but i do think it's american that that it's accepted it's, you know, and when you read these women talking about what happened, like for instance, what the the the, the, the woman, well, oh my God, the woman who who was um, allegedly, I'll, I'll turn this correctly, molested. Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll, she was felt up by Al Franken, Senator Al Franken. Yeah, this is a a woman who is in the service. And, and she was asleep, asleep. And this guy is feeling her up, and he looks at the camera and he's smiling, and he thinks it's funny. What, what, what about that is funny? What about, what about pedophilia is funny? What about, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, why is it that the 23 men in, in my story are killed in, in the bayous and, Nobody gives a you know nobody gives a crap because of their sexuality. I think what that really says is that we have a culture that at times devalues human life, and unless we speak out about it, it's going to continue to happen. And I'm going to continue to speak out about it when I have the opportunity here. But it isn't very often I get this opportunity, <laughs> so. You know, I don't. I mean, I don't. And 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 it just, you know, and I, I it just disgust. Look, I got a daughter, and if somebody got to get hurt my child, um, I'll tell you right now, um, um, you're not going to make it to trial, okay? Uh, I'll talk to my friend Luca Brasi, you know, <laughs> from The Godfather. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Seriously, seriously, this is this is a it's almost like an epidemic now. Yeah, you know, am yeah. I wrong? No, no, and, and the the thing is, I think that if you look at the big picture, but I agree with you, but you know, look at it back in the sixties and seventies, um, mm. how far back it was, and I think about. Uh, being a gay man in the 60s, what it would be like when it's actually against the law <laughs> in the U.S. You could get arrested. Mm. And 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 you look at, um, you know, I watch the game shows. I watch the old game show channels to come down yeah, yeah. after working. And there was a, um, oh, boy, what was it? It was, uh, oh, it was, say, where they meet, like a, uh, like a newlywed game. Oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 the thing is, um, the, you know, and then uh, I remember the host asked the guy um, what he did, you know, when he's introducing them, and the guy said what he did for work, and 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 what did your wife do? Well, I haven't. He goes, I haven't decided whether or not I should let her work. And, oh my god! And, but I just thought, you see, could you imagine saying that nowadays? First of all, the man's deciding whether or not the, his wife could work. Plus, he's answering the question for her. <laughs> and and I'm thinking, you know what? You know, yeah, you know. But look at that. 
And that's just in my lifetime, in your lifetime, to now. And it's come a long way. I'm not, I'm not trying to justify oh, no, that, that, no, 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 no. You, you're making a very, very good point. We've come a long way. Yeah. But you know what? In, 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 I, I have my Master of Fine Arts from USC's legendary film school. And next year, I will be producing a low-budget film noir, which I'd love to talk about on your show. Um, and the, the thing is, I grew, you know, we, you know, if you take a look at the films in the late 30s with people like Rosalind Russell, etc., they were much stronger characters, the women. They were independent. And, uh, but that was the movies. And they were not typical. Right. And, and then you go forward and you, you, you're making a tremendous point, which is you go forward and into the, into, you saying the 60s, the 70s, the 80s too. You know, and, and, you know, I, you know what? I, I have a, a, a cousin, um, I have a cousin who, who, who came out Oh, I don't know. He came out sometime probably in the 1990s. And I know for a fact that some members of my family, my birth family, have rejected him because of that. Not his parents or his sister. But, you know, you know, I, 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 you know, yeah. it's just, it's just to me, to me, it's all a question of how we're raised and Again, with Kendall, uh, not Kendall Francois, with, I'm mixing up my serial killers. Only I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but with Ronald J. Dominic, when he talks about what his family did to him, well, I might argue that his family maybe needs to take a little responsibility. What happens if they treated him the right way? I suspect we're not having this conversation. You know, you know, sure, serial killers, most of them are, are sociopaths, psychopaths, etc. But there's a million sociopaths in our, in our society that don't commit murder. And, and there are other aspects. I think that we have it within our grasp to, to um, help people. You know, and 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 and, and to, to to do the right thing, but but I guess the thing that's missing is, to me anyway, is the role models. I mean, if Ronald J. Dominic had had the right role models, we're not talking about this. In our generation, I believe we did. Yeah, more so. And, more so. You know, um, you know the breakdown. Start at some time in the '60s when uh, both parents started to work. Oh my God! And you're talking to a latchkey kid, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was on my own at eight years old, and it was awful. Right. And uh, and I'm helping my mother out right now, who's 97, and I'm finding out why I became independent. Duh! Yeah. People yeah. don't change. Yeah. You know, people don't think, and especially when it comes to discrimination. Oh my God! You know, I mean, it, it just well. You know what? I'm, I'm going on. I don't mean to go on and on. I just, and I, you know. <laughs> well, you get the point. I, I, yeah, you know. That's um, it, and <laughs> and you know, I, 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 yeah, exactly. And um, so, and, but the good news here is. Then by the Strangler, they got the bad guy. They cleared all 23 murders. They did closure to the families. What well, you can't in law enforcement, you cannot ask for anything more. No, and uh, no, and uh, we appreciate that. Well, Fred, we are run out of time here, so we have to wrap it up. Now, your book, of course, is on Amazon and everywhere else. We'll have it on our website as well. It's called the, Bi the Bayou Strangler, that. and that's Louisiana's most gruesome serial killer. And our author is Fred Rosen, friend of the show, and we're glad you came on again. This is Jeff, Al, 
Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.